Within the broad eternal sky, the east star baits to glorify each timid sunlit rosy ray that ushers in the coming day while night in tenderness yet dwells anear the down soft ring ye hells and slow ye welcoming Christmas bells Harriet Maxwell Converse It was the holiday season of 1891. As usual, the townsmen in Clinton were preparing for the season, setting their mode for the incoming holidays. It had been like this for generations. Living in this small town with a population no more than 800, life was good to them. The business was good. The land was affordable. People were happy. Everything seemed to be perfectly arranged, and there were plenty of opportunities that lay ahead for this little community. In 1891, times were great. Uh, The country as a whole was doing quite well. We were in the midst of the the Gilded Age. Uh, The Panic of 1893 hadn't yet come along. Um, But there was was an underbelly within society where where things were were difficult. And you had somebody like Jacob Reese, who authored a book entitled How the Other Half Lived, detailing poverty in the country. In Clinton, though, things were, were doing really well. We had a thriving downtown and an industrious people who were busy humming away at business. We had a a dry goods store, a clothing apparel store that was stocked with goods for the winter. We had a hardware store. There were a couple of meat markets and the good times were rolling here. In the early 1890s, Clinton was almost a Norman Rockwell town. Small, quiet, nothing much ever happened, but the people liked the community. But something was about to go terribly wrong. A devastating fire on October 30th, 1891, was about to reshape all that forever. In the 19th century, natural disasters such as a fire burning a city or a town are nothing new to the citizens. On October 8, 1871, an unknown reason caused the fire and burned a large part of the city of Chicago to ashes, taking about 300 lives with it. On that same day, the city of Peshtigo in Wisconsin caught on fire as well. The fire was so great that 12 towns were affected by the burning taking 1,200 lives along with uncountable economic losses. Pushing back another 30 years, an unexpected fire stormed lower Manhattan of New York City. Overnight, 674 buildings had been destroyed. Not even a year earlier, in 1890, the Clinton Music Hall on the West Main Street was burnt to the ground. But this time, the fire that started in their own town scaled bigger than any other fire in the area. Burning out almost entire businesses on the main street had created an unthinkable impact on the people that lived in the town at that time. The concept of firefighting wasn't anything new in New Jersey, and there was ample warning throughout the nation of the dangers that a fire could pose. For instance, you know, the the Chicago fire in 1871 was a very notable example of the dangers that a fire could cause. Now, here in Hunterdon County, we did have several serious fires. The Ringo's Tavern had burned down in February of 1840, and we had a fire in Flemington several years later. 
which prompted the residents there to create, build a cistern in town, which held 20 hogshead or 63 gallons of water. And they also formed a fire company, which was called the Fame Firefighters of Flemington, which was comprised of the prominent residents in town. Now, now Clinton didn't have a, a fire company even as late as 1891. And of course, it, it led to some disastrous consequences. No one had seen this fire coming. Everything in town seemed perfectly normal, just like any other day. The local baseball season had just wrapped up not long ago. And this season, Clinton's club, the town's team, didn't score well, losing most of the games. But it never stopped their enthusiastic fans from cheering for them. It was a fun time for all. During a game of ball on the afternoon of the fourth, Elwood Johnson, who was catching behind the bat, was struck on the end of his right thumb by the ball and quite badly hurt. The music hall had just opened for the season. And this season, the appreciators loved the midnight alarm in particular regarding the show as well-rendered by a company of fine artists. Meanwhile, they anxiously waited for more shows coming to the town. Newly inaugurated Mayor William E. Johnson seemed happy to see everything going well under his watch. Days ago, he had just issued a notice that prohibited bicycle riding on the town sidewalks, thinking that it would be in everyone's best interest. However, he wanted to do much more for the town, building better roads, for example. The citizens had voiced that they wanted to have better roads in the area for some time. There were other problems, too. On July 4th, some wild kids from Highbridge rode through town at 3 o'clock in the morning, were firing guns and pistols, ringing the Methodist church bell, singing, shouting, and disturbing the sleepers. Another unfortunate event was that poor little Willie, the young Nebraskan boy who grew up in this area, was bitten by a rattlesnake, causing his death. Townsmen caught word of these incidents, but thankfully, they did not affect Clinton. Overall, it still was a happy town. Then it came to the business owners. In the past spring and the summer, these merchants had worked hard to make sure they were maintaining high sales and that they did well. The COPCS, the largest clothing retailer in town, owned by Mrs. C.H. Rittenhouse, pronounced that her store sales had surpassed those of any previous year. She was now preparing for the incoming winter and holiday season. The goods had arrived. The store now is piled with men's, ladies, and boys' suits, odd pants, shoes, Mrs. Shoes, and hats of all kinds. A couple of stores down, there was a boot and shoe retailer owned by G.W. Gebhardt. He seemed to be doing good as well. To compete with other bigger stores, such as John Lunger's, a tenant of local landlord Alex Probasco, and COPCS's, who all claimed that they had a large selection of boots, G.W. Gebhardt made his specialty in selling Martin shoes, and he wanted his customers to know that his Martin shoes were the best in the market. To strengthen his business strategy, he had recently hired the handyman, Frank Beeman, to make a new sign to make the store much more appealing. It worked. Now all he wanted was to have another good holiday season. In the meantime, he could take a breath. A week ago, he invited John V. Tunnison and his wife, a fruit and vegetable market owner on the Main Street, along with their friend, William Waitman from Jersey City, to enjoy a delightful carriage ride through the country. Two young townsmen, George Manning and John Carey, also realized the business opportunity on Main Street. In March of the previous year, they decided to set up a fish market on this corner of Center and Main Street. For a year and a half of running the operation, it was quite satisfactory. 
this incoming season would surely add much profit in their pocket. But everything didn't go as they planned. October 29, 1891. It was Thursday night. For some reason, Mrs. Charles Lee wasn't able to sleep well. A lot of things were going on these days. Her father-in-law, John T. Lee, the largest landowner of the town and former mayor, was in old age and didn't feel well. Also, that month was about one and a half years since she and her husband had moved from Lee Street to a house on Main Street, thinking that was much more suitable for their needs. Strangely, at 3 a.m., as Mrs. Lee opened her eyes, she was terrified by what she was seeing, a fuzzy fire reflecting in the mirror. She jumped out of her bed and sprinted towards the window. She saw that across the street, G.W. Gebhardt's store was on fire. She rushed to wake up her husband and pushed him to ring the cast iron ring. One of them heard the ringing alarm and outcries of people shouting fire, including Selma Gulick's mother, Jamie Gulick, who lived on the corner of Main and Lee Street. William Wigan, sexton of the Methodist Church, also heard the alarm. As Gulick ran to the scene to help, Wiggins rushed to the church to ring the church bell. But now, the fire was about to swallow John Lunger's store, and the entire building owned by Alex Probasco was at risk. At the time of the fire, the construction of the buildings was old heavy timber with no fire stopping, no fire separation walls, uh, which allowed the fire to spread quickly throughout one building into multiple buildings and create the catastrophe of the downtown Clinton area in which it did. Um, today, the standards have changed to be able to maintain um, a control of that fire into the uh, individual buildings where the fire is at. Now the whole town was completely awakened People in the moment rushed to the scene to help. Some joined the bucket brigade, bringing water from the nearby river. Some helped to take valuable things out of the burning buildings. Gulick, at this moment, was also busy taking things out from an unburned building. The fire was completely out of control, running in all directions. At some point, the superheated air stormed across the south side of the street, causing G.W. Gebhardt's building to burn. Back then, um, we used a bucket brigade. Um, the resources that came into the town to fight the fire came from the uh, Phillipsburg Easton area, from the Flemington area, and uh, which was a quite a delay in response of, of getting that equipment here and being able to, uh, to fight the fire. Mayor Johnson finally realized that the bucket brigade of his own town didn't do any good. He then telegraphed for help. At the same time, John Lunger's store and the rest of the building owned by Alex Probasco had been burned badly. It was beyond saving. The fire now was extended towards both sides of the buildings. Three neighboring towns, Flemington, Easton, and Phillipsburg, quickly mobilized men and equipment heading to Clinton to help. The fastest and easiest way to have firefighters and engines and hoses would have been from Flemington, because it had the railroad running directly to Clinton. But somehow, they found no cart to load the engines. It ended up that the firefighters came to Clinton with empty hands. Now Clinton had no other options but waiting for the engines and hoses from Easton and Phillipsburg. It was a painful long wait, because those men and the equipment from these two cities needed to travel about 17 miles by horse to get to Clinton. At the same time, the fire was sweeping the Main Street properties in a fast pace. The fire now began to attack William Kramer's property, a little house in the rear of Alex Probasco's building, where it also had a barn full of horses. As the flames penetrated into that part of the area, the horses got scared by the superheated airwaves and fire flashes and ran wild. Soon, everything started to burn. Back 
back then with the uh, size of the fire that was uh, what, what was burning at the time and the resources, the delay in the resources getting here, there was really no way of, of controlling and extinguishing the fire and keeping it from spreading. It was a matter of just extinguishing what rubble was left and um, and, and, and just being able to, uh, to, to extinguish the fire. Um, there was really no way to uh, to to stop the fire spread, it, it burned the area that was uh, that it was burning with uh, with no control, and uh, it's kind of disappointing to to see a whole town get wiped out by uh, by a fire like that, and nothing that you can really do about it. One of the saddest scenes and hardest for people to bear was the burning of COPCS. Mrs. Rittenhouse's new holiday ad no longer seemed relevant. The engines, hooks, hoses, and ladder trucks from Easton and Phillipsburg finally arrived. Together, they helped townsmen to get the fire under control. In the end, many properties and businesses were saved, including Mr. Perry's house, which today has become a historic building in Clinton. The fire prevention and construction codes back when the fire occurred were non-existent. The buildings and structures were allowed to be built very close together and of combustible construction, hence causing the fire to jump from building to building very quickly. Nowadays, those buildings are not permitted to be built that close, and if they are, they have to be of a non-combustible construction to prevent that fire spread. I wish those codes were present back when the fire occurred. The spread of the fire and the fact that it wiped out the downtown might have been avoided if the town had, um, you know, had a plan in place to fight fires, it had a fire company maybe and a water supply ready to go. Um, obviously there's water nearby, but if you don't have that plan in place, you're, you're gonna run into some problems. They had to rely on flyer, fire companies coming from Flemington and Lambertville and Easton. And of course, by the time that the fire companies got here and were able to lend assistance, so much of the downtown had been wiped out. It, it just went up so quickly and it's a shame. The damage by the fire was severe. About a total of 12 businesses and buildings accounted for 80% of the business on Main Street. From C.H. Rittenhouse's fashion clothes to Hoffman's daily supplies. From J.W. Garrison's fresh meat market to John V. Tunnison's fruit and vegetables. From Alex Probasco's livery stable to A.W. Staunt and A.L. McRae's sewing machines. All had been completely burnt to ashes, with an estimated value of 140000 to $150,000, an unthinkable value of loss during that time. The days of raging fire finally stopped, leaving the town in a great ruin. No one seemed to be able to find a reliable evidence of the cause of the fire. Many blamed John Lunger's dog. Some said that during those years, John Lunger kept the dog to watch his shop on the main street. It was cold during those days, so he kept the stove on and had a blanket on the dog to keep it warm. Somehow, the dog dragged the blanket too close to the stove and caused the blanket to burn. But whether it was true or not, the main street had been burned. While this ruined site was attracting countless people from the neighboring areas to witness the burned Main Street, the townsmen, however, had realized the urgency with which the town needed the fire equipment and firefighters for future fire prevention. The following month after the fire, the town-wide debate on this issue that took place intensified. The holiday season became the battle of debate on the hot issues of buying fire equipment for the town. On December 7th, 1891, the town held a special election to decide what question should be submitted to the legal votes to decide how much to spend and where to buy the fire engine and other apparatus. Mr. Baker said he had been to the city 
and had looked around among the places where fire apparatus When some sold, people give figure as to what could and, and could not could be done with a steam I move that the Common Council to purchase a fire apparatus and that the same shall not cost Mr. more than $5,000. of 12 Barclay Street, New York, is a manufacturer of fire department supplies, $5,000. And Mr. Dean Woodhouse of 12 Barclay Street, New York, who is a manufacturer of fire department supplies, was present and and gave some manly and direct answers shall not to cost questions more than five thousand dollars. We are in favor now of the engine. The Clinton Democrat. The Clinton November Democrat. November nineteenth, eighteen ninety-one. November nineteenth. The Clinton Democrat. November nineteenth, eighteen ninety-one. In the end, the decision was made, and the vote for erecting its own fire department was passed. In the following year, on March fourteenth, eighteen ninety-two. The town formed its own fire company, Clinton Steam Engine Company Number 1. Preamble of Clinton Fire Department, 1892. We, citizens of Clinton, New Jersey, for the protection of property against fire, thy organize ourselves as a fire company, and thy established for our government the accompanying constitution and bylaws.